Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Developmental Differences in Children Who Have Experienced Adversity, Emerging Evidence and Implications for Practice. My name is Elise Davis and I'm Manager of Workforce Development and Evaluation here at the Australian Institute of Family Studies. Today's webinar presentation will outline emerging evidence on the impact of early adversity on children's development and implications for practice. In addition to this presentation, a series of practice guides focused on developmental differences in children who have experienced adversity has also been developed and will be released later this month. Please subscribe to the CFCA newsletter to receive notification once they are available. Now, before I introduce our presenter, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we are meeting in Melbourne. The traditional custodians are the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I pay my respects to their elders past and present and to the elders from other communities who may be participating today. And firstly, just some housekeeping details. So one of the core functions of the CFCA Information Exchange is to share knowledge. So I'd like to invite everyone to submit their questions via the chat box at any time during the webinar. We will respond to your questions at the end of the presentation. We'd also like you to continue the conversation we begin here today. So to facilitate this, we've set up a forum on our website where you can discuss the ideas and issues raised, submit additional questions for our presenter and access related resources. We will send you a link to the forum at the end of today's presentation. As you leave the webinar, there'll be a short survey. It will open in a new window and we would really appreciate your feedback. Um, please remember this webinar is being recorded and the audio transcripts and slides will be made available on our website and YouTube channel soon. And it's now my pleasure to introduce today's presenter, Dr. Sarah McLean. Sarah is a consultant psychologist and adjunct fellow at the Australian Centre for Child Protection. She has worked in the area of child and adolescent mental health since 1997 and has a particular interest in developing effective supports for children in care. Sarah has expertise on the psychological issues associated with fetal alcohol syndrome disorder and the mental and behavioural needs of children living in foster and residential care. Sarah was the recipient of the ACU Linica Fellowship at Oxford University in recognition of her work supporting children in care. She consults to government and non-government agencies on children with complex support needs, including high stakes behaviour. Please join me in giving Sarah a very warm virtual welcome. Thank you very much, Elise. Um, and thank you to everyone who's taken the time to take part in this webinar today. I know that everyone's very busy, so um, I do appreciate um, that. And I'd just like to acknowledge that there's a lot of material that I'm going to cover today. Um, but that you're a large and diverse audience. So um, I'd like to acknowledge that I, pro I possibly won't meet um, uh, everyone's learning needs today. So please do feel free to post questions or to email me um, directly after this uh, webinar so that I can make sure that you get your um, burning issues addressed. That would be great. Okay, so um, as Elise has mentioned, um, I'm a psychologist by background. My experience is in child and adolescent mental health, um, where I was a senior clinical psychologist in um, a few tertiary therapeutic day programs for young people with serious and significant behaviour and mental health issues. Um, I've also been involved in research, um, and my research is very much applied. Um, and addressing the issues uh, involved in supporting children with complex and um, challenging behavioural and mental health issues in out-of-home care space. So focused on foster care, residential care, um, and uh, as Elise mentioned, um, a very strong focus on raising awareness about the impact of prenatal events on children's lives, in particular fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. My current focus is on um, research translation and hence um, the reason for this webinar today to, to um, bring uh, emerging research knowledge into uh, practice um, and generate a bit of discussion in practice around what that might mean for supporting children and families. In this um, presentation, I really just want to do two things. Um, one is to highlight, um, as Elise has done, that there are some 
a series of four practitioner guides that are coming out soon. Um, uh, sounds like they might be out later on this month um, and they form the basis of the second half of this presentation um, and they're about the emerging neuropsychological uh, sorry neurocognitive research uh, around uh, real-time uh, brain reactions to um, to social and um, uh, emotional stimuli in children who've experienced early adversity and the second part of um, the other the thing that I'd like to achieve today is to really give you a broad overview of the program of work that I've been undertaking for the last, last little while, in which I've tried to focus on uh, common developmental trends or developmental needs amongst children who've experienced a range of early life adversities um, and also amongst children who have um, clinical disorders of childhood that um, are associated with behavioural, emotional and mental health issues. Um, so I've called this work um, uh, the issues that I've uncovered, uh, I've called them developmental differences. Um, and I really like this term because obviously developmental tells us that, it, that these differences arise in the context of a child's developmental experiences, um, which also includes their prenatal experiences. Um, and differences in recognition that um, children who've um, experienced um, significant um, early life adversity have reasonably predictable uh, patterns of neurodiversity. So differences um, in the way that they process uh, and interact with the, with the world. Um, so differences, not better or worse, just sort of different. So recognising that um, many children who've experienced early adversity will have developmental differences um, and then beginning the conversation about what we could do to um, offer more effective services for these young people. Um, as I said, I'd like to, um, one of the goals for today is to just give you an overview of the kind of work that I've been doing in case it's of interest. Um, a lot of my work has been involved in um, a program of research, but then research into practice regarding uh, the needs of children with developmental difference and particularly in out of home care. Um, I'd really like to highlight that um, this isn't just my idea, this is consistent with uh, international trends in research and research translation. Uh, that are beginning to step outside of diagnostic labels and diagnostic approaches and really focus on addressing the underlying um, difficulties or differences in the key domains of functioning that affect children's behaviour, learning and social uh, experiences. Um, and if you'd like to see uh, around some of the research programs that have been done in this space, um, I would refer you to the National Institute of Mental Health in the USA. So this is a growing trend in preventative mental health uh, internationally. And this is really just to say that the approach that I've taken has been very much um, around uh, integrating diverse bodies of knowledge um, to identify common elements. And here's a nice little schematic that sort of simplifies uh, the body of work that I've been doing. Um, so firstly, in the area of clinical and forensic psychology, I've really drawn on the evidence base regarding childhood disorders that are known to be associated with challenging and complex behaviours, particularly those that uh, affect placement stability. And I've also drawn on the childhood um, uh, disability or diagnosis, um, diagnostic literature um, to draw on um, the information about what is known about uh, common clinical disorders of childhood that are also common in children in out of home care. So for example, conduct disorder, uh, which we would expect about 60% of children in out of home care would attract a, a diagnosis of conduct disorder, anxiety around 11%, depression around 17%, I believe, and so on. So I've really asked what are the common functional difficulties experienced by this, uh, this group of children? Secondly, I've drawn on the literature that is, um, theoretical but also research literature in relation to the effect of early childhood events. So the theories of complex trauma, theories of attachment um, and the evidence base around early traumatic experiences and experiences of neglect. 
but also uh, the larger and really much more robust evidence base around the impact of prenatal alcohol and other substance uses, which of course are significant issues for our children um, in the care system or, or most of our vulnerable children. Um, so for example, with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, we estimate that across all settings, um, out-of-home care settings and internationally, we conservatively estimate that around 17% of our kids um, are would attract a diagnosis of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Finally, drawing down on the emerging evidence base regarding structural and functional difficulties um, that arise uh, from the body of neurocognitive research. And I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, when we come to the practitioner resources. And really with an aim to um, highlight common themes, um, common developmental issues and across the um, across all these bodies of work. Just from a philosophical point of view, I just want to say that um, often when we start talking about neuropsychology, we start to, people start to think that it's a very reductionistic approach. Um, my view is it's just one piece of the evidence. And this kind of approach in focusing on developmental differences is not supposed to be a substitute for relationship-based interventions. Um, attachment interventions that emphasise significance, um, the significance of safe and nurturing relationships or trauma-informed principles. My argument would be that these are essential to our interventions in the child welfare space, uh, but I would argue they're necessary but may be not sufficient for many children in out-of-home care. I believe that the approach to um, addressing underlying difficulties or differences captures, the better captures a broad range of complex influences that can affect children's lives. Um, I think we need to cast a wider net than we do when we focus on attachment or trauma. Um, and arguably I would say that, and certainly this is the trend in international literature, that this kind of approach might be more likely to result in targeted as opposed to broad brush interventions. And this is really um, not a deficit model or a deficit way of thinking per se. Um, I like to think of it as an ecological kind of approach. We can think of um, children's difficulties that arise in the context of early adversity in terms of differences in the way that they process the social, informational um, and um, cognitive sensory information in the world. So primary differences in the way that they experience the world uh, that become, can become or have the potential to become problematic over time. And I think the fetal alcohol spectrum disorder literature um, addresses this issue very nicely when they make a distinction between primary and secondary difficulties. Um, so here's my attempt at a schematic to sort of uh, explain this. So we have a child with developmental differences who's developing over time. Um, surrounding the child with developmental differences is their caregiving environment, um, which can either support or hinder their development. And so we, we believe now that the kind of caregiving environment that supports a child with developmental difference uh, is a highly structured and predictable environment in which caregivers are able to change their expectations to meet the needs of the child, to meet a child at their developmental level. Um, that they're able to scaffold and simplify a child's world by using visual support, simplifying their language and so on. And we'll talk a little bit more about that a little bit later. Um, and finally, and particularly um, as a child gets older, we need to be asking how they experience the services and systems that we provide for them. Because these social interactions can either magnify or um, support the child with different magnify their difficulties or support the child with developmental difference. What coping strategies are we teaching them and how are we interacting with them as service providers? Um, before I move on to talk about developmental differences, I just wanted to touch briefly to let you know some of the work that I've been doing and some of the work that I'm hoping to do in the near future. Um, firstly, and most um, probably most importantly, uh, for those of you who are working with foster carers, um, I've developed a series of free resources for foster parents, which is part of began as part of a project supported with a generous, um, by the generous support of the Eureka Benevolent Foundation. Um, and uh, these were co-developed in partnership with foster carers. So I'm appreciative of the time and expertise that they offered to the project. Um, I've developed a basic website, which is the Fostering Difference website, where you can see the logo down there. 
um, and you may want to have a look at that and download some resources um, that are targeted at foster parents um, and we're looking to upgrade and um, uh, improve that website um, uh, over the next few months. Um, there's, I've also written a book for foster parents that should be coming out shortly um, that outlines the differences in um, caregiving that are required for children with developmental differences. Um, I've been fortunate enough to um, to contribute to policy um, and therapeutic frameworks around residential care, foster care and secure care and I'm um, interested in developing some training materials in that space. And shortly there'll be, I, I think in the next month or so, there'll also be uh, an update of the therapeutic residential care paper coming out um, through the CFCA uh, uh, portal or website. Um, I've also started beginning uh, putting together some resources for child protection workers and support, foster care support workers, and currently writing a chapter for a book around the educational needs of children with developmental differences. Um, so just to, to give you a sense of the kind of um, research to practice translation activities that I've been involved in, if you'd like to learn about those, um, the Fostering Dif Difference website is a good place to start for foster parents, but you can also um, uh, get updates via the Facebook um, of Fostering Difference once, once that becomes active. So I'd encourage you to visit there. All right, so what are the main developmental differences experienced uh, by children who've experienced early adversity? Um, and much of, this much of this information is available on um, either the Fostering Difference website or some of the CFCA papers that I've done in the past. So you can probably search on the CFCA website and find some of these. So the first uh, area of developmental difference relates to um, children's sleep and circadian rhythms. And this is an area of um, difference that people don't often focus on. We, we, and when we do, we're kind of aware that a traumatised child might have nightmares or they might have difficulty with sleep onset insomnia. But um, what we don't appreciate often is that uh, children who've had experienced early adversity can have um, a lot more free-floating circadian rhythms and have a lot more difficulty than we do in anchoring their sleep-wake cycle to the to the daily rhythms um, of society. And for foster parents who are raising children with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, in particular, um, we'll talk about the profound sleep di disturbances that happen as a result of this um, a pervasive developmental issue. Um, so children with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder will often sleep for you know two or three hours, four hours, and then they'll be awake for a long time. So they've profoundly disrupted and exhausting sleep patterns for carers. Secondly, children can have difficulty in regulating their sensory world and that means they could be over-responsive or under-responsive to the sensory world. But what it really means for children is that the sensory world can affect their level of alertness, their level of arousal, so that it becomes they become sleepy or they become hyperactive and it becomes much more difficult for them to engage with the world and benefit from learning, um, benefit in a learning environment. Uh, and just to let you know that at the Fostering Difference website, I've um, got a resource on sensory regulation that's developed specifically for foster parents. So you're welcome to um, visit that and download that resource. The other area of developmental difference um, that I'd like to highlight is profound differences in language, um, in comprehension and communicating. Uh, children who've experienced early adversity of all sorts will have, are likely to have difficulties in re receptive and expressive language. So they can have delayed receptive and expressive language, but also disordered language. Um, and a very common form of language disorder is pragmatic language disorder, which can be very difficult to detect and sometimes masks the level of difficulty that children are having. So uh, pragmatic language disorder relates to uh, difficulty with um, the social use of language. So difficulty in turn taking, uh, taking language very literally, trouble with abstract concepts like goal setting and um, 
reflecting on behaviour and so on. Uh, and particularly when it comes to asking children to reflect on their behaviour, language issues have a profound impact on children's ability to, um, to engage in reflective, um, uh, to, to engage in reflection about what they might have done wrong and what's contributed to their behaviour problems. And, and that's something that we often ask them to do. So on the Fostering Difference website, I've um, got a resource that explains language in simple language disorders in simple, relatively simple language. Um, and that's designed for foster parents. But again, it might be something that uh, other workers might find useful as well. Um, okay, so. Other developmental differences that have come out of uh, this research and research integration uh, are difficulties in emotional regulation. I think people are much more familiar with the concept of difficulties in emotional regulation amongst children who have experienced early adversity. We know that emotional regulation difficulties are common amongst children who attract um, a diagnosis of conduct disorder fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, anxiety disorder, oppositional defiant disorder, and so on. All the disorders really. Um, so difficulty with emotional regulation is a big um, issue. Um, and there is a, a resource uh, about emotional regulation on the Fostering Difference website. Um, I just like to flag in case I forget to do that later um, that we often focus on children who have poor emotional regulation, as in um, they're very emotionally expressive and over, uh, overly dramatic, um, overly attention seeking, and some of the labels that get um, attached to their emotional regulation difficulties. But equally, children can have um, emotional regulation difficulties in the sense that they um, uh, have trouble even expressing emotions or recognising emotions. So they're very re emotionally restricted. So you can have the two extremes and uh, we tend to focus more on the, the in your face kind of kids rather than the more introverted um, internalising children. Okay, difficulty with executive control. So executive control is like the air traffic controller of our brain. It's executive control is central to uh, our ability to um, set goals and achieve goals. It's central to our ability to think flexibly, to manage transitions and adapt our behaviour from situation to situation. Difficulties with executive control are very well documented uh, in the clinical liter literature around uh, autism spectrum disorder, conduct disorder, anxiety and trauma. Uh, and once again, there is a resource developed for foster parents that um, you can refer to uh, to help explain in simple languages what language what um, executive functioning and executive control is all about. Um, and finally, um, there is uh, what the cognitive behavioural therapists will call uh, a hostile attribution bias in many children who have experienced early, in, in, uh, early um, adversity. So what that means is they have a heightened perception of threat uh, in social situations or in response to social interaction, but also that they find, tend to find social interaction a less rewarding. Um, and we'll talk about that in a minute when we come to the neurocognitive literature. So it's, um, this concept is really well known in cognitive behavioural therapy um, where th these kind of issues are explicitly addressed in kind of approaches that we use for anger management, um, managing of anxiety and depression as well. So there's some good cognitive behavioural strategies that we can draw on. Um, and I think I've just put that paper there about the effect of trauma on brain development, just to, to, for those of you who may not be aware, it's a resource that I wrote uh, towards the end of 2016. Um, that really provides a general overview of the current state of evidence and theory in relation to brain development and trauma that I thought you might find interesting or useful. 
Um, and so all of these difficulties are um, on this slide are really the same difficulties that were found um, in the neurocognitive research. Um, and so I want to move on to talk about that because they are the impetus, that research is the impetus or the, the stimulus for developing those four practitioner resources uh, that will be coming out later this month. Yeah, and this is really just to say the remainder of this webinar is really drawing on the program of work developed by um, Emma McGorry and colleagues at University College London, which has really done a lot of work in terms of integrating neuropsychology, um, the structural neurobiology and the functional neurocognitive research. Um, uh, and what that might mean for children who've experienced early adversity. So as I said, the idea for the resources came from that work, um, which was published late in 2017. So I was keen to get that research out to practitioners as soon as possible. The only um, concern that I have around this research, or it's not a concern, but it really, we need to be aware that, um, that neuropsychologists and neurocognitive researchers tend to use pretty set paradigms to explore children's functioning. Um, they, they tend to explore information processing and the processing of social stimuli like angry faces um, and those sorts of things in fairly um, experimental controlled conditions. Um, they don't explore things like um, sensory regulation or sleep disturbances as such. So they find what they go to look for in other words. But anyway, notwithstanding that sort of concern about the literature, um, they, this, this program of neurocognitive research, which looked at the real time reactions of children's brains to um, uh, social uh, stimuli such as angry faces or threatening stimuli such as angry faces, they found these four areas of developmental difference, similar to what we found in our literature reviews. Um, as neuropsychologists, they talk about these in terms of latent, being latent vulnerabilities, um, being underlying processing differences that convey uh, a vulnerability in the child for um, the development of mental health issues later in life, or perhaps in response to a stressful trigger later on in their life. And the four areas of developmental difference that come out of this neurocognitive program of work, work uh, are, are two involving social information processing, and that is the way that um, social or neutral stimuli, neutral social stimuli are experienced as threatening, the way that neutral social stimuli um, are not uh, experienced as rewarding, and the way that emotions are con uh, processed within the child's brain, and also the way that executive tasks uh, are processed in the child's brain. These differences in the neurocognitive research um, are really capturing differences at the neural level. Um, it's different from the structural research, which looks at shapes of different areas of the brain, so the size and the functioning of different areas of the brain. This is around capturing the reactions at a neural level in real time um, as, as children process different stimuli in the world. So those are the four areas that form the, the basis of the practitioner resources that'll be coming out later in this month. Why did I think this was important stuff to highlight to practitioners? Well, I think because it really encourages us to take a, um, a preventative approach uh, to our work. And I know that we try to do that, but it really highlights um, some of the underlying difficulties that can become mental health concerns later on down the path without uh, sufficient support. So it um, challenges us to think in a little bit differently about what we can do, do to prevent the development of mental health issues for children. Um, significantly, these, um, this program of neurocognitive research found that these developmental differences in social information processing, uh, emotional regulation and executive control were, were existed in children even who appeared to be uh, on the surface uh, perfectly healthy, um, who had not yet experienced any mental health issues. So they exist, 
whether or not there are mental health issues or behavioural issues in place. Um, they uh, occur in a way um, and a level and a, a characteristics that are, are comparable to adults who have mental health concerns and psychiatric concerns. What I really like about this body of work, work is that they view these developmental differences uh, as entirely appropriate and adaptive res brain responses to their early, to children's early caregiving environment, but acknowledge, um, much like the ecological model, that they can convey, they represent a difference that can convey vulnerability later in life, depending on what else happens to a child. Um, the other significant thing is that um, they view these developmental differences as possibly rendering children less able to benefit from uh, and less able to take part in the kind of corrective experiences that we would like them to have. So for argument's sake, you know, to place a child into a foster home, who's a child who's experienced early adver adversity, they may still, even though they are in a nurturing and supportive environment, may not have the, um, the their underlying developmental differences may minimise their opportunities to um, uh, benefit from corrective social experiences. And it really highlights, um, that series of papers really highlight the need for, for preventative interventions um, and mental health first aid or you know, stress inoculation approaches for families and uh, children and families who are experiencing adversity. Um, and also the need for targeted uh, interventions that specifically uh, address the underlying developmental differences in uh, social uh, information processing, executive functioning and emotional regulation. Okay, so um, now I'd like to move on to actually what these papers uh, demonstrated in terms of the developmental differences. And I'll deal with threat processing and reward processing together as, as two of the ways that children's uh, experience of the social world is altered as a result of their um, early life adversity. So two ways that social information processing is altered. First, um, this body of research um, on real-time responses to stimuli um, showed us that children who've experienced adversity have an altered, um, uh, an often enhanced reactivity to stimuli that can be seen as potentially threatening. Uh, so in these kind of scenarios, it would be a picture of an angry face. So they're more reactive to those kind of stimuli. We know this is significant because children, um, adults who um, uh, have significant mental health issues, uh, there's also been this kind of documented uh, altered threat response in those psychiatric populations as well. So we know that there's a link between uh, these difficulties and the development of mental health issues. Uh, what um, the neurocognitive um, research sh tells us is that, um, and this is very good longitudinal research, is that if you take uh, a child and you measure their threat reactivity at time one, um, prior to any major stressful life event uh, that we know of, if they have high threat reactivity at that time um, and then they've been subsequently exposed to a stressor or, or removal or placement in home or some sort of stress like that, um, then the, their threat reactivity at time one predicts um, the development of psychopathology in those children later on in their lives. So we know that it conveys a vulnerability for mental health issues over time. Um, we know that this difference in threat reactivity can be detected as early as 15 months um, of age. So it can uh, come about very early in a child's life. For children who've experienced institutional neglect or neglect in the context of in institutional upbringing, um, they also have um, significantly more subcortical sort of, uh, uh, real estate invested in um, the detection of threat cues. Uh, 
um, and this happens in a dose dependent way so what that means is the longer the period of emotional neglect in an orphanage the higher the threat response uh, and also in child welfare or social service populations we've all They've, these researchers have also found that compared to match controls, there is a dose dependent increase in threat reactivity, uh, which is proportional to the level of abuse um, and the complexity of the abuse that they've experienced. So all that is very consistent with the theory of complex trauma, but uh, it's more complicated than that because uh, there's also emerging research that children can engage in enhanced vigilance, but also enhanced avoidance. So for some children, there's actually a lower um, reaction to threat. Um, and we don't quite understand the reason for that, but um, we know it's interesting to note that um, heightened vigilance, seeing threat where there is no threat and engaging in behavioral avoidance are two core characteristics of anxiety disorder. So we think that children with this altered uh, reactivity to threat can be more vulnerable to the development of anxiety. Okay, moving on to um, uh, children's uh, neural response to rewarding stimuli. Uh, what we know is that, or um, uh, well, there are many reward systems in the brain. The one that they're mostly focused on in this body of research is the reward systems that um, drive our anticipation of um, impending reward which is uh, driven by the dopaminergic system. So really the, the anticipation that this, this stimulus or this uh, interaction is going to be rewarding from a social perspective. And we know that, um, uh, th that you know, children who have a blunted uh, or a diminished reaction um, in anticipation of social rewards, they are um, more vulnerable to the development of mental health concerns over time. Um, and there's some of this neurocognitive research has shown that even in large 1,500 um, sa uh, samples of 1,500 um, community, um, ch teenagers living in the community rather, um, who are ostensibly healthy, when, when those, for those children who, or adolescents who have, um, have been found to have this blunted or diminished response um, in their brain, at a brain level in the anticipation of reward, those children are at more risk for the later development of depression. Um, even when they were not currently experiencing mental health issues. So that's very important to emphasize. Um, and McGorry and colleagues have also found this blunted anticipation of social reward response in, um, in their maltreatment research as well. Um, so all of that is very deficit focused and negative and that's the, pretty well the nature, can be the nature of this work, um, but it's, it's also significant to notice where um, research has looked at children who have a heightened anticipation of reward response and we, um, this research demonstrates to us that these children can, um, this can actually be uh, a protective factor that for these children are at less risk of developing um, depression over time. Uh, and so that gives us great hope that intervening in this space will actually offer protection to children. And Eamon McGorry uh, makes a point that these differences in the way that children process the social world are really about um, uh, perfectly um, adaptive um, survival mechanisms uh, that uh, mirror the child's, perfectly match the child's early caregiving environment. But from our perspective as supporters of children and families, what these differences in social processing um, may convey is a really perfect storm of risk factors. Um, Macquarie makes a note that they these things often coexist. Um, that place and so these difficulties or these differences may place the child in increased anxiety uh, risk for anxiety and depression, uh, starting off a reinforcing spiral um, in which there's a child might have less desire to explore the world because the world's a scary place, and they also might have less motivation to explore or to um, uh, and therefore they have less opportunity to have corrective experiences because um, the social world is not, they don't anticipate any joy coming from the social world. 
Okay, so what does this all mean for what we do with families? Um, this is really uncharted territory. I think the first uh, thing to really uh, put in the forefront of our minds is the fact that um, is the fact that uh, children's experience of social interaction is different. It's fundament can be fundamentally different from what our experience is. Um, and um, I think it's also important to help them reframe uh, this difference in terms of a positive and clever survival strategy. Like the public health approach or a public health concept, I really like the idea of stress inoculation training. That is using um, positive evidence-based programs uh, and activities taken from positive psychology and mindfulness in particular to support um, a positive outlook, staying focused on the present, um, noticing the positives and developing gratitude. There's also a need to uh, take a graduated approach to children's social experiences. Um, we can think of it in cognitive behavioural terms as an, uh, an exposure hierarchy. So we really want to gradually introduce them to um, social situations and give them more and more opportunities to master and experience positive interactions. And finally, there's a very strong evidence base around cognitive behavioural approaches to supporting children to identify, um, highlight and challenge some of the automatic assumptions that underpin their beliefs around social interaction in the social world. Okay, so um, moving on to uh, another major area of difference that was identified in the neurocognitive research is that around emotional regulation. We've already touched on this, but this speaks to more the neurocognitive research around that. And basically emotional regulation is, um, is implicated in many adult psych psychiatric diagnoses. Uh, and so we know that um, in some way or another, it's often related to poor mental health outcomes in children. When um, the McGorry's um, reviews have looked at um, the relationship between uh, emotional regulation and maltreatment, they have cited um, studies that have looked at uh, poor emotional regulation at age seven, um, by the age of seven as being predictive for later uh, poor mental health outcomes, uh, particularly of an internalising you know, anxiety and depression form. Oops, pop that up there. So the majority of the research shows that emotional regulation is much more effortful. It requires much more cognitive resources to, um, for a child to engage in emotional regulation if that child has a history of early life diversity, uh, early life adversity, sorry. Um, but there are some uh, interesting patterns emerging um, in that, um, in that, uh, uh, some children actually, um, particularly in relation to um, social stimuli that are um, involved in rejection, so threats of rejection, they actually engage more in uh, avoidance than trying to control and regulate their world. Okay, um, so what can we do about it? Really, um, we don't know much about this, but what we think works well is taking them right back to their developmental level, building the uh, emotional language that they need to support their emotional development. Uh, they need to have the language first before they can actually uh, engage in conversation and reflective practice around um, their emotions. We need to support them to understand how their emotions are reflected in their own bodies in the unique ways and particularly children who are highly somatic. We need to um, support them or children and families to devise and rehearse ahead of time ways to safe emotion, express their emotions um, and to develop cognitive coping and act, active coping skills. Um, and because uh, children's social emo and emotional development ha happens in a social context, um, often they have the message that they need to deny or distort emotions, that some emotions aren't safe to express or they haven't been safe to express in the past. So we really need to ensure that we are role modelling um, the 
the way to express emotions or that all emotions are acceptable and exposing them to positive role models in that regard. Okay, and the final area of neurocognitive um, uh, difference that was identified in these extensive reviews relates to this this issue of uh, executive control and executive functioning um, and executive functioning really is a, a whole ra a range of interrelated uh, brain functions that um, that go together to make up our ability to think on our feet to benefit from feedback to predict uh, the outcomes of our actions uh, and to adapt our behaviour uh, from situation to situation, task to task and conversation to conversation. Um, we, it's been likened to the air traffic controller of the brain. It's significant because executive functioning difficulties are intimately involved with many psychiatric diagnoses, especially of those of the OCD sort of ruminate, cognitive rumination type of um, difficulties. Um, so what does the neurocognitive research show us? And that it shows us that in uh, children who've been um, institutionalised or experienced institution, institutional neglect, um, these are the orphanage type studies, uh, they, these children um, show greater activation in areas of the brain that are involved in this effortful control of uh, executive functioning, particularly when it comes to shifting from task to task, uh, which many foster parents know very well. So that transitioning from task to task and that cognitive flexibility and also keeping track of their performance and monitoring their own performance. Similarly with samples of um, adolescents who've experienced abuse, um, there's also this uh, increased activity in the areas of the brain that are involved in the effort for control of executive functioning. Um, in the case of adolescents, this focuses more on inhibiting their behavioural responses and keeping track of their behaviour. Um, but uh, the last thing I'd like to say about that is that in um, longitudinal work though, um, in terms of the outcomes for children, uh, this work has also highlighted the significant contribution of um, a children's overall cognitive ability before um, stressful or traumatic events um, and general sort of specific um, disadvantage factors that are related to their socioeconomic um, background. Um, for me that highlights the potential uh, of or the significance of um, intel intellect or IQ, but also prenatal um, alcohol exposure. And so what can we do about this um, for children? Uh, the hallmark of a poor executive functioning is difficulty with transitions and difficulty in fl thinking flexibly. We can help children by providing a structured and predictable environment. Um, we like to support carers to adjust their expectations of children to simplify their interactions and simplify their environment by providing visual supports um, and transitions of all types need to be supported by a structured process um, and warnings and there are visual cues that you can use to support transitions in children with exe poor executive control. And I just want to say that these um, strategies are all outlined in the Fostering Difference website, um, but also will be outlined in the CFCA resources once they come out at the end of the, um, at the, end of the month. Um, and we also need to scaffold them and teach them the missing skills. So there are very good strategies for supporting kids to plan, to monitor their own activities, to build their working memory during you know, using games or phone apps uh, and to we need to support them with their flexibility in their thinking, being able to adapt from situation to situation. And we do that by highlighting what's same and what's different about upcoming events. Um, so those strategies are all outlined in the resources that I've referred to. Okay, so just to summarise, you know, how can we um, support caregivers um, and how can we service providers make uh, life better or easier for children with developmental difference. The first thing is really, to my mind, really keeping the forefront of our minds that um, once we place a child in physical safety, it, it is not the same as their experience of psychological safety. Um, they, they may, they're likely not to find social interaction rewarding um, and that we need to support children and families with invulnerability, who are experiencing vulnerability and, and early life adversity in the evidence-based CBT, positive psychology and mindfulness strategies for all families 
irrespective of which, uh, irrespective of whether or not they're currently uh, showing any mental health and behavioural issues. Um, for children who've experienced early life adversity, um, we may it may be about going back to the basics around their emotional vocabulary, um, their permission to express different emotions, uh, encouraging emotional expression in children who are who are um, avoidant, um, and encouraging coping strategies in those who are overreactive. Um, and particularly the case for children who also have language issues, which is extremely common in, in out-of-home care as well. Um, and we also need to build into our parenting programs the capacity to um, capacity to build their executive functioning skills by providing a, a, a supportive environment, a structured environment, and um, helping them to build the necessary skills. And I'll just flick to the end here um, and I think this these strategies are useful for all children um, who've experienced adversity uh, not just children in care and not just those that are showing current mental health issues so I just want to finish there with um, the opportunity to um, consider a couple of questions about you know how can we support parents and caregivers and how can we as service systems uh, and practitioners uh, how can we make um, our services and our interventions uh, more useful for children who are likely to be living with developmental difference? And thank you for your time.